Good morning and welcome to the Boston Scientific second quarter 2024 earnings call. All participants will be in listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing star then zero on your telephone keypad. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. Please note this event is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to John Monson, Senior Vice President, Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, Drew, and welcome everyone, and thanks for joining us today. With me on today's call are Mike Mahoney, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, and Dan Brennan, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. We issued a press release earlier this morning announcing our Q2 results, which included reconciliations of the non-GAAP measures used in this release. We have posted a link to that release, as well as reconciliations of the non-GAAP measures used in today's call to the Investor Relations section of our website under the heading Financials and Filings. The duration of this morning's call will be approximately one hour. Mike and Dan will provide comments on Q2 performance, as well as the outlook for our business, including Q3 and full year 2024 guidance, and then we'll take your questions. During today's Q&A session, Mike and Dan will be joined by our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Ken Stein. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that on the call, operational revenue excludes the impact of foreign currency fluctuations, and organic revenue further excludes acquisitions and divestitures for which there are less than a full period of comparable net sales. Relevant acquisitions and divestitures excluded, organic growth, are the majority stake investment in Aquatech Scientific Holdings Limited and the acquisitions of Apollo Endosurgery and Relevant Med Systems, which closed in February, April, and November 2023, respectively, as well as our acquisition of the Endoluminal Vacuum Therapy Portfolio from Bebron, which closed in March 2024. Divestitures include the endoscopy pathology business, which closed in April 2023. <clears throat> Guidance excludes the previously announced agreements to acquire Axonix and Silk Road Medical, both of which are expected to close in the second half of 2024, subject to customary closing conditions. For more information, please refer to the Q2 Financial and Operational Highlights deck, which may be found on the Investor Relations section of our website. On this call, all references to sales and revenue, unless otherwise specified, are organic. This call contains forward-looking statements within the meaning of federal securities laws, which may be identified by words like anticipate, expect, may, believe, estimate, and other similar words. They include, among other things, statements about our growth and market share, new and anticipated product approvals and launches, acquisitions, clinical trials, cost savings and growth opportunities, our cash flow and expected use of cash, our financial performance, including sales, margin, earnings, as well as our tax rates, R&D spend, and other expenses. If our underlying assumptions turn out to be incorrect, or if certain risks or, or uncertainties materialize, actual results could vary materially from the expectations and projections expressed or implied by our forward-looking statements. Factors that may cause such differences include those described in the risk factors section of our most recent 10K and subsequent 10Qs filed with the SEC. This statement speaks only as of today's date, and we disclaim any intention or obligation, obligation to update them, except as required by law. At this point, I'll turn over to Mike. Mike. Thanks, John, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Our second quarter results exceeded our expectations, led by the strength of our differentiated global cardiovascular portfolio, particularly the execution in AF solutions and the winning spirit of our global team. In second quarter, total company operational sales grew 16, Organic sales grew 15, exceeding the high end of our guidance range of 10 to 12. Our top tier growth continues to be fueled by innovation, clinical evidence generation, and our strategy of category leadership. Consistent with prior quarters, most of our businesses and regions grew well above market. Second quarter adjusted EPS of 62 cents grew 15% versus 2023, <clears throat> exceeding the high end of our guidance range of 57 to 59 cents. Second quarter adjusted operating margin was 27.2%, and as a result of our first half margin performance and revenue upside versus previous expectations, we now expect to expand adjusted operating margin 50 to 70 basis points for the full year. Turning to the third quarter and full year 24 outlook, we're guiding to organic growth of 13 to 15% for 
third quarter, and raising our full year guidance from 10 to 12 to 13 to 14%, reflecting momentum across our broad portfolio, particularly in our EP business unit. Our third quarter adjusted EPS guidance is 57 to 59 cents, and we expect our full year adjusted EPS to be 238 to 242 representing growth of 16 to 18%. Dan will provide more details on our financials, and I'll provide some additional color on the quarter and the outlook for the second half of 24. Regionally and on an operational basis, the U.S. grew 17 in second quarter, with exceptional growth in EP, fueled by the continued success of the Ferropulse launch, as well as Watchmen, coronary imaging, and strength in our med surge businesses. Europe <clears throat> grew 16% on an operational basis versus second quarter 23. This impressive performance was driven by double-digit growth in seven of our eight business units, led by robust growth in EP and strength across our growth in emerging markets. Second quarter was also a record quarter in the region for our structural heart business, following positive data presented on accurate NEO2 at the recent Euro PCR conference. We expect this momentum to continue, supported by the launch of the larger size Accurate Prime Valve in late 24. Asia Pac grew 13% operationally versus a difficult comp in second quarter 23, with excellent performance in China <clears throat> growing high teens and Japan growing double digits. We also recently received approval in China for Ferropulse and Agent Drug Coated Balloon, and continue to expect approval for Ferropulse in Japan in the second half of this year. We expect the contribution from these launches will ramp over 2025. Within the quarter, pricing actions in key geographies went into effect with the China VBP on coronary imaging and Japan reimbursement cuts in June. We do expect Asia Pac to grow low double digits in the second half of the year, including the full impact of these pricing actions. Some additional commentary on the business units. Our urology business grew 9% organically in the quarter with double-digit growth in stone management and prosthetic urology, supported by our direct-to-patient efforts driving patient awareness and early contribution from the limited market release of the Tenacio pump. International growth of 14% was driven by laser therapies and Resume. We look forward to closing this previously announced acquisition of Exonix, which we continue to expect in the second half of this year. Endoscopy sales grew 8% both operationally and and organically in second quarter. Second quarter results were driven by above market growth in our biliary franchise, led by high teens growth in Axios and the high teens growth in our endoluminal surgery franchise. We continue to expect endo sales to go faster than the market throughout 24, enabled by our innovative portfolio. Neuromodulation sales grew 16% operationally and 4% organically in the quarter. Our brain franchise grew low single digits with some impact from competitive product launches. We expect this business to strengthen in the second half of the year, <clears throat> driven by our portfolio of differentiated technologies. In second quarter, our pain franchise grew strong double digits operationally and mid single digits on an organic basis. Our spinal cord stem business saw improved U.S. trialing cadence in the quarter, and we expect that our U.S. SCS franchise will improve in the second half of the year. The relieving business continues to perform extremely well with more than 30,000 patients treated with the Intracept system to date. Peripheral intervention sales grew 12% operationally and nine organically versus second quarter. High single digit growth in arterial was driven by continued momentum in our drug looting portfolio which, with double digit growth in the quarter. Mid-single digit growth in Venus was driven by momentum of ECO supported by the real PE data set and continued double digit growth in Verathena. Our interventional oncology franchise grew double digits in the second quarter, driven by our broad offering across embolization and cancer therapies. Looking forward, we continue to expect to close the previously announced acquisition of Silk Road Medical in the second half of this year. Cardiology. Cardiology delivered another excellent quarter with organic sales growing 22% versus second quarter 23. Within cardiology, interventional cardiology therapy sales grew 9%. Growth in coronary therapies was driven by continued strength in our global imaging franchise and APAC calcium franchise. Within the quarter, we initiated a limited launch of Agent DCB in the U.S., 
which has received positive initial physician feedback. Our structural heart valves franchise grew strong double digits in the second quarter, led by accurate NEO2, which continues to see growth from both new and existing accounts in Europe and Latin America. At the end of the quarter, we also completed follow-up of the full 1,500 patient cohort and the U.S. accurate IDE trial. We now expect to present this data in the first half of 2025, <clears throat> likely at the annual ACC meeting. Watchman had another excellent quarter, growing 20% organically, with strong contribution from the ongoing launch of Watchman Flex Pro in the U.S. and Japan. The U.S. grew 20%, led by further penetration into the existing indicated patient population, enabled by our innovation, clinical evidence, and patient awareness efforts. Cardiac rhythm management sales grew 3% organically in the quarter. In second quarter, our diagnostics franchise grew double digits. This above market growth is driven by our broad cardiac diagnostics portfolio. In core CRM, our high and low voltage business grew low single digits with strong international growth partially offset by slightly below market growth in the U.S. At the recent HRS meeting, data was presented from the modular ATP trial of the modular CRM system, which is comprised of the empowered leadless pacemaker and emblem SICD, which met all pre-specified six-month endpoints, and a high rate of ATP success with no patient request for deactivation of pacing due to pain or discomfort. Turning to EP, EP sales grew an impressive 125% organically versus second quarter 23, driven by the rapid and sustained adoption of the transformative Ferropulse PFA system. Second quarter sales were driven by outstanding commercial execution, robust supply, and positive real-world outcomes, as well as increased AF ablation volumes supported by the efficiency of the Ferropulse workflow. Our Bayless Access Solutions business also continues to see strong double-digit growth in the U.S. with the utilization of approximately 80% of PFA procedures and approximately 85% of Watchman procedures. Internationally, we saw continued Ferropulse account openings and robust utilization in Europe and launched APAC markets. Importantly, evidence of more than 20,000 patients treated with Ferropulse has been published or presented at medical conferences demonstrating the safety, efficacy, and reproducibility of the system. And within the quarter, we completed an enrollment in the Navigate PF study of the Fairview software module and Fairwave Nav-enabled catheter, both of which are expected to launch in the U.S. during the second half of the year. At the recent HRS meeting, outcomes from a sub-analysis of the ADVENT trial were presented. This is the very first randomized data for a PFA system demonstrating superior efficacy versus thermal modalities, with significantly more patients having achieved an arterial arrhythmic burden of less than 0.1% with Ferropulse compared to RF and cryo. We plan to continue a steady cadence of clinical evidence generation to maintain our PFA leadership, including Rematch AF, a planned trial designed to study the Ferropoint and Ferrowave catheter in patients who need a redo ablation, which we expect to begin enrolling early in 25. In closing, I'm very grateful to our global team for the commitment and winning spirit enable us to deliver life-changing technologies to millions of patients. One of the most exciting chapters as a company with a track record of executing or exceeding our financial goals while delivering meaningful innovation. With that, I'll hand it over to Dan. Thanks, Mike. Second quarter 2024 consolidated revenue of $4 billion, $120 million represents 14.5% reported growth versus second quarter 2023 and includes a 160 basis point headwind from foreign exchange, which was slightly unfavorable versus our expectations. Excluding this $57 million foreign exchange headwind, operational revenue growth was 16.1% in the quarter. The sales impact from closed acquisitions was 140 basis points, resulting in 14.7% organic revenue growth, exceeding our second quarter guidance range of 10 to 12%. Q2 2024 adjusted earnings per share of 62 cents grew 15.4% versus 2023, exceeding the high end of our guidance range of 57 to 59 cents, primarily driven by our strong sales performance. Adjusted gross margin for the second quarter was 70.4%, contracting 160 basis points versus the prior year period, driven by higher-than-expected inventory charges, 
related to the Polar X cryoablation system, given the strong commercial adoption of Ferropulse in the U.S., as well as increased levels of capital placements in the quarter. We continue to expect second half adjusted gross margin to be higher than the first half, driven by the mixed benefit from key product launches and full recognition of our annual standard cost improvements. We expect full year adjusted gross margin to be slightly below our 2023 rate. Second quarter adjusted operating margin was 27.2%, which expanded 40 basis points versus the prior year period. Given our strong first half operating margin and our expectations for the second half, we are raising our full year 2024 adjusted operating margin expansion goal to 50 to 70 basis points from 30 to 50 basis points compared to 2023. We believe this strikes a nice balance of delivering incremental margin from our sales upside and continuing to invest appropriately to drive strong top line performance. On a gap basis, second quarter operating margin was 12.6%, which included intangible asset impairment charges related to the acquisitions of Criterion Medical and Devoro Medical. The criterion impairment charges were related to the high conversion rates of cryoablation to Ferropulse for ablation procedures in the U.S. The Devoro impairment charges were related to the decision to discontinue work advancing the Wolf thrombectomy platform. Moving to below the line, second quarter adjusted interest and other expenses totaled $68 million, which was favorable to our expectations. On an adjusted basis, our tax rate for the second quarter was 13.1% which includes favorable discrete tax items. Our operational tax rate for the quarter was 13.6%. Fully diluted weighted average shares outstanding ended at 1,484,000,000 shares in the second quarter. Free cash flow for the second quarter was $660 million with $814 million from operating activities, less $155 million in net capital expenditures, which includes payments of $200 million related to acquisitions, restructuring, litigation, and other special items. In 2024, we continue to expect full-year free cash flow to exceed $2 billion, which includes approximately $700 million of expected payments related to special items. As of June 30th, 2024, we had cash on hand of $2.9 billion, and our gross debt leverage ratio was 2.4 times. Our top capital allocation priority remains strategic tuck-in M&A, followed by annual share repurchases to offset dilution from employee stock grants. In alignment with our acquisition strategy, in Q2, we announced our agreement to acquire Silk Road Medical and closed the acquisition of Soundcat, a pre-revenue, privately held medical technology company developing an intracardiac echocardiography product, complementing our existing electrophysiology portfolio. Our legal reserve was $251 million as of June 30th, a decrease of $32 million versus Q1 2024. $54 million of this reserve is already funded through our qualified settlement funds. I will now walk through guidance for Q3 and full year 2024. We expect full year 2024 reported revenue growth to be in a range of 13.5 to 14.5% versus 2023 excluding an approximate 100 basis point headwind from foreign exchange based on current rates, we expect full year 2024 operational revenue growth to be 14.5 to 15.5%. Excluding a 150 basis point contribution from closed acquisitions, we expect full year 2024 organic revenue growth to be in a range of 13% to 14% versus 2023. We expect third quarter 2024 reported revenue growth to be in a range of 13% to 15% versus third quarter 2023, excluding an approximate 100 basis point headwind from foreign exchange based on current rates. We expect third quarter 2024 operational revenue growth to be 14% to 16%. Excluding a 100 basis point contribution from closed acquisitions, we expect third quarter 2024 organic revenue growth to be in a range of 13% to 15% versus 2023. We now expect full year 2024 adjusted below the line expenses to be approximately $300 million. Given discrete items recognized in the first half of 2024, we now expect a full year 2024 operational tax rate of approximately 13.5%, 
and an adjusted tax rate of approximately 12.5%, which contemplates current legislation, including enacted laws and issued guidance under OECD Pillar 2 rules. We expect full year adjusted earnings per share to be in a range of $2.38 to $2.42, representing growth of 16% to 18% versus 2023, including an approximate four cent headwind from foreign exchange which is unchanged from our previous expectations. We expect third quarter adjusted earnings per share to be in a range of 57 cents to 59 cents. For more information, please check our investor relations website for Q2 2024 financial and operational highlights, which outlines more details on Q2 results and 2024 guidance. And with that, I'll turn it back to John, who will moderate the Q&A. Thanks, Dan. Drew, let's open it up for questions for the next 40 minutes or so. Uh, in order for us to take as many questions as possible, please limit yourself to one question. Drew, please go ahead. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your telephone keypad. If you're using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. If at any time your question has been addressed and you would like to withdraw your question, please press star then two. Again, please limit yourself to one question. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble our roster. The first question comes from Robbie Marcus with J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Oh, uh, thank you, and uh, congratulations on another fantastic quarter here. Um, Thanks, Robbie. Thanks, Robbie. With my, my one question, I want to ask about guidance and the sustainability. This is a, it was a big quarter. You had a big first quarter. PFA is, is clearly outperforming. Watchman had a great quarter. A lot of the rest of the business continues to fire on all cylinders. So I, I'm seeing about 14% organic for the back half of the year, which is, is a really healthy rate. And I guess really the question is, how do you feel about continuing through 24 and really into 25? Is this a pull forward of the revenues expected in the long-range plan, or do you think there's better demand, better market adoption, better volumes underlying pricing that could keep, you know, maybe not 14%, but something elevated for the foreseeable future. Thanks. Sure, Rob, I'll, I'll take a shot at, you know, we're not going to give uh, 25 guidance here, but you know, at our investor day, we, we said our goal was to be the highest performing med tech company uh, in terms of sales and EPS growth. Um, which we, which we believe we did in 23. Our aim is to do that in 24, and our aim is to do that for many years to come. And I think one is, is the, the primary drivers of you've seen the decade-long portfolio shift into faster growth markets for the company, where our you know, weighted of average market growth rate is probably closer to 7 to 8% uh, versus what it used to be kind of flat. So one, we enjoy, because of our portfolio choices, um, faster-growing markets, um, secondly, we have uh, strong growth across the world. You're seeing Europe double digits, Asia-Pac double digits, where Fair Pulse is not yet um, launched, and obviously the U.S. Uh, doing quite well as well. And then I think you just have to look at the uh, the durability of other businesses. You know, we'll likely talk about Fair Pulse and Watchmen a lot on the call, but you see continued strong growth. Uh, you know, eight to nine ish percent uh, through the first half. Uh, within our med search businesses. So that kind of gets diminished uh, because of the strength of some other areas, but uh, that's pretty good. And then the cardiovascular portfolio is just getting stronger and stronger uh, with our EP franchise, Bayless, what we're doing with uh, coronary, with drug-coated balloon. You saw the results with Accurate uh, in Europe. Um, and also potentially some benefits with concomitant uh, reimbursement in the future. And who knows, maybe these procedures may move over time to an a ASC center in EP, which also we think would benefit uh, Boston Scientific given our solution. So we had a tough comp in 23 with a 12%. Uh, our guidance for the full year is now 13 to 14. We won't give 25 guidance, but uh, our goal is to be really distinguish ourselves from the peer group in terms of revenue growth and EPS, and we have the portfolio and the team to do it. Appreciate the thoughts. Thanks. The next question comes from Joanne Wunsch with Citibank. Please go ahead. 
Uh, thank you so much for taking the question, and I echo um, a very nice quarter. Um, can we un unpack just a little bit, and you may not like this question, but I get it a lot. What's next? And how do we think about, to your point, we're going to talk about fair policy and watchmen a lot, but people are now sort of looking forward at how does, how does this continue to roll out to deliver this kind of growth? And thank you. Yeah, I think it's, thanks, Joanne. I think it's a, similar to some of the themes I, I just highlighted. We have, uh, we're in higher way the average market growth rate markets to start. We see consistent uh, procedure volume around the world. Um, we are in a pricing environment where we used to be a price giver pretty significantly. Now it's uh, getting closer to negative one to zero. Uh, we also expect in the margin front, you know, we took our margin goals up for the year. We expect gross margin to improve over time. Right now we're getting more margin benefit from uh, SG&A primarily, which is good leverage. Uh, we expect to get more gross margin upside over the uh, LRP period. And we just have a very strong product uh, cadence in very fast-growing markets. You know, the, the two, two of the best markets at all of MedTech, obviously, are EP and Watchmen. And we have strong leadership position in PFA, um, and that market's only growing. And we haven't launched yet in Asia. And we have a lot of clinical work going on with Watchmen, as you know, to significantly increase the TAM of that market, where it will rival, rival the TAVI market, you know, three to five years from now. So the clinical evidence that we have in fast-growing markets differentiated portfolio, and we continue to make uh, and place strong M&A bets with uh, Axonics and Silk, and our venture portfolio, which will continue to leverage. So um, the playbook hasn't changed, but I'm, it's the execution of the team of continually putting this in better markets and out executing the competition. Thank you very much. The next question comes from Larry Beagleson with Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning. <clears throat> Thanks for taking the question, and, and uh, congrats on a really nice quarter here. Uh, Mike, maybe just to drill down on um, on EP and, and Farrah Pulse, um, I guess it's a similar question, but just uh, the sustainability here of the growth and the share. By, by our math, that looks like you've captured about 15% of the US EP market in the second quarter excluding Bayless, um, help us understand how uh, durable, durable uh, your EP share and growth is. You know, can EP continue to be a growth driver for Boston Scientific for years to come? And, and what's driving your confidence you can compete effectively with, you know, Afera and, and Varipulse when, when they launch? Thank you. So I'll start, and then Dr. Thine can maybe talk about how we're really leading uh, the field in our clinical evidence and some other physician comment. You know, we're competing with those companies today in Europe, uh, with with J and J, with uh, with well, all the all the companies who have PFA platforms. And you've heard us talk on many calls now on the differentiating of Ferropulse in terms of its uh, safety profile, the clinical data, and the really the usage of physicians who never considered using Boston Scientific EP prior, many of them have completely converted to using Ferropulse um, for their AFib ablation procedures. But we're still, you know, relatively early in our launch in the U.S. We have, it's, it's less than six months of launching in the U.S., and we have yet to launch in China, and we have yet to launch in Japan, and we have a lot more to do in Europe, and we have additional indications coming and additional portfolio coming. So we think the short story is, you know, the Ferropulse platform combined with Bayless, combined with our clinical, will be a, a differentiated growth driver for Boston for many years to come. Now, will it grow, you know, as it continues to scale up over 100% a quarter? Unlikely. But we expect this to be maybe the biggest business of Boston Scientific in the years to come here. Yeah, and, and, and Larry, maybe just to, to sort of add on what Mike said, right? First, just, I mean, the AF is the most common sustained arrhythmia in the world. Ablation therapy for AF today is, is still dramatically underpenetrated, right? I mean, ablation, high single digits penetration for persistent AFib, low double digits penetration for paroxysmal AFib. And the safety advantages, the efficacy advantages, the efficiency advantages, and just the overall 
simplicity of the Farapol system, I think, are, are just going to continue to drive the size of that market and penetration into that market. Uh, and then in terms of the competition, right, again, you know, we, we do expect to see competitors bring out their first generation products late this year, early next year. They're already approved in, in, in Europe. And frankly, as, as, as Mike said earlier, right, we have not seen that materially impact the, the rapid, the sustained adoption of Farapulse in Europe. Farapulse is a transformative technology with really important differentiated advantages against these competitors. Uh, as Mike said, right, treated over 70,000 patients to date, published clinical trial data on over 20,000 patients to date, which really testifies to, to the safety, to the simplicity, to the efficiency. And again, Mike, Mike referred to the data we presented at the Heart Rhythm Society, right, it is the only system right now with any data testifying to actually superiority in an efficacy measure against traditional ablation. Thank you. The next question comes from Rick Wise with CFL. Please go ahead. Hey, Rick, can you hear us? Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, please go Rick, ahead. We can hear you now. We can hear you now. Okay, great, sorry about that. Um, I, I was hoping uh, also to talk about uh, PFA from another perspective. Um, uh, in my recent doc checks, I've heard a, a great deal of encouraging interest in rhythmia uh, and um, and uh, obviously in, in many cases are being mapped now with other companies' uh, uh, systems. Uh, it just maybe give us some more color on uh, it, when you launch uh, your mapping integrated catheter in the second half. Uh, I assume that's still the target. Uh, how do we think about the implications for rhythmia adoption for the percentage of cases that could be mapped on the rhythmia, rhythmia system and the impact on your growth uh, outlook as a result? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Rick. I appreciate the question. Uh, again, we, we still are projecting approval of both our NAV-enabled Farrowave catheter and a completely new software suite on Rhythmia that we're calling Farrowview to help support that. Uh, and we certainly do expect that to help drive more adoption of the use of Rhythmia and Farrowview to accompany Farrowave. Now, I, I want to begin, though, by saying but Farapulse will remain an open system. We want to support workflows that don't involve any use of mapping or navigation, support workflows that involve these competitive systems, but also we'll expect with FaraView and Farawave Nav to provide some major advantages in terms of workflow. Uh, I think important for me to I think emphasize that existing mapping and navigation systems don't understand PFA at all. They were built around an RF ablation paradigm. And, and so FaraView is going to be the first software in a mapping system that fundamentally understands what we do with PFA and with Farapulse. Uh, there are some important features, dynamic visualization of the catheter as it changes shape from basket to flower configuration, field tagging specific to PFA energy. And I think when you put all of that together, it has the potential to minimize the use of fluoroscopy during these procedures, minimize catheter exchanges, and really continue what we've tried to do and I think have accomplished with Farapulse to begin, right, which is to create a procedure that, that is safer, that is at least as effective, and that is far more simple and efficient compared to what people have been doing with legacy systems. Now, on the financial side, as you know, you've seen some of the competitive reports. You know, mapping is a sizable chunk of the overall EP procedure. And when Ferropulse is being used, you're seeing increased procedure volume based on the efficiency. So some competitors are benefiting from that uh, productivity gain of Ferropulse. So in addition to strong utilization rates and opening new centers, you know, more broadly Im impacted in 25, uh, we do expect a number of physicians to adopt uh, this Fairview platform that Ken said, which is additional revenue that you're not seeing today in the Ferropulse EP procedure. That's great. Thank you so much. 
The next question comes from Vijay Kumar with Evercore ISI. Please go ahead. Hi, guys. Thanks for taking my question and uh, my uh, congratulations on my experience here. Uh, I had one question on uh, USPFA, uh, the 220% growth. Um, w- w- can you um, can you parse out what was uh, capital contribution versus uh, you know capital contribution in that U.S. number? And I think you mentioned uh, um, a TPT, uh, you know, for for uh, in, in the U.S. in the outpatient setting. Any update on uh, has has Boston submitted uh, its uh, TPT? Thank you. Yeah, so thanks for the question. Yeah, we're, we're not, unfortunately, we're not going to break out for you the capital uh, and disposable. A disposable is obviously more sizable than the capital, but that's probably the color we'll provide on that. And on the, uh, you know, overall pricing, you know, as you do know, the pricing is a, a bit of a premium, but based on the clinical benefits and the efficacy and the efficiency uh, that physicians and customers are enjoying, enjoying uh, that seems to be the proper p- price point. And on TPT, Ken, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, VJ. Uh, so we have submitted for TPT. Again, I think important to recognize there are some very strict criteria for eligibility for TPT. And I think just to reiterate what Mike said, which is, you know, right now we are not seeing pricing as a barrier to the rapid and sustained adoption of Farapulse. Next question comes from David Roman with Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, and, and and good morning. I, I, I want to keep going a little bit on on the EP side, but but also, could you talk a little bit more about both the technology and commercial strategy? And if you think about the technology side right now the bulk of the, your business right now sits in the ablation side. You talked a little bit about the importance of mapping and access, but how should we think about the, the portfolio evolving and how that unlocks new opportunities for you, whether that's in the non-AF side of the ablation market, be it with Ferropoint or some of the other products? And then on the commercial side, where, where are the opportunities for pull-through here? So, for example, are you training your mappers on generator replacements and ICDs, and how should we think about the overall benefit to the portfolio? Again, I guess, Ken, I'll try to tag team this. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, it's, it's this may be the best market in MedTech, about $10 billion market. The chunk that we're doing well in now is the $6 billion AFib market uh, that we continue to uh, strengthen, and we'll get approval, as you know, in, your, in Asia Impact in 2025. Uh, there are a number of other areas that we're trying to uh, move into, uh, the mapping segment uh, based on the – Previous commentary is one. Uh, we do have an a organic ice program, uh, which we hopefully will, which is a 510k uh, product. Hopefully, will be competitive with a new ice platform during this LRP period, which is a another large slice of it. And Ken can probably detail out a bit more the clinical studies that we're doing to widen the indication uh, for Ferropulse uh, beyond what uh, is used today. Yeah, thanks, Mike. So, David, uh, let me start with the. Uh, the clinical strategy and maybe say a little more about where we're going from a technology standpoint as well, uh, because I think it's important, right, that all the other stuff we're doing doesn't just get lost in the excitement around Ferropulse, as exciting as Ferropulse is. Right, from a clinical trial standpoint, uh, to begin with, our Advantage clinical trial, which is aimed to get uh, labeling for Ferropulse in persistent AFib, uh, has completed enrollment. Uh, we expect to present those results uh, uh, late this year, uh, early next year. Uh, we are well underway in a trial called Avant Garde, which is aimed to prove that Ferropulse should be used as first line therapy uh, for patients with persistent atrial fibrillation. Uh, we've announced an intent to run a trial called Rematch, which will look at Ferropulse uh, for redo ablations. And from a technology standpoint, we've already talked about the Farrowave NAV catheter. Uh, in addition to that, we have a point catheter, Farrowpoint, that's through its clinical trial. Uh, and then down the road, I think more sophisticated catheters for both mapping and ablation, uh, a catheter called Farrowflex. Uh, and I think, as you can imagine, we are interested in the use of this for many arrhythmias beyond atrial fibrillation, uh, uh, atrial tachycardias and trichotachycardia. tachycardia. Uh, that pretty much you name it. But but I don't want some of the other technology innovations 
to, to get lost. And, and so, right, the EP performance was not only a Farapol story, uh, fantastic performance from our access solutions portfolio. Uh, and in terms of pull through, right, see very good synergy between Farapulse and the access solution products. Likewise, in really good synergy between uh, the Watchman and the access solution products. Uh, again, I think, you know, in terms of the pull through question, but the most obvious opportunity, as Mike mentioned, is the opportunity now to have reimbursement in the U.S. for concomitant Farapulse ablation and Watchman procedures, uh, which we expect will be a growth driver and hope to see that finalized before the end of this year by CMS. Uh, again, Dan mentioned our acquisition of SoundCath and so, so an ICE product to support uh, EP procedures and potentially also Watchman procedures. Uh, probably just a very long-winded way of saying uh, we, we love Farapulse, but it is far from the only story. The next question comes from Patrick Wood with Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Fabulous, thank you. And, and on that note, I might flip the script if that's right with, uh, with everybody and maybe focus on something a little different. Um, you know, obviously you guys, you guys announced Silk and appreciate that hasn't closed yet, but I'd love if you could unpack, you know, what was so exciting for you guys in TCAR and that asset overall and the ability to flip wall stent into uh, the package and, and how meaningful that is relative to just the capacity to plug it into Boston overall and, and drive sales. Anything around that would be great. Sure. Silk is a really a terrific asset we've looked at for a long time. Uh, hopefully that we aim to close that in the second half uh, this year. You know, as a standalone business, they were uh, really kind of leading the rejuvenation uh, of that field through their clinical evidence and their and their performance over many years in the U.S. And it came to a point where we felt uh, it was mature enough in terms of its uh, sales ramp and um, uh, for us to acquire it at the right at the right price. So I guess, first of all, it always starts with clinical indications. Uh, we're really pleased with the data and the long-term uh, durability of this procedure. Um, so as a standalone company, they're growing certainly accretive to Boston Scientific faster, uh, but clearly not there on the margin front. So now in Boston Scientific's hands, uh, we feel like we can grow the company faster uh, in the U.S., uh, given the um, category leadership portfolio we have and a common call point with a vascular surgeon. We also have the ability to take it outside the U.S. to appropriate uh, countries. And we also, uh, you know, aim to improve the margin profile of the business uh, by integrating uh, the company as appropriately within our operations supply chain team like we've done um, for many other acquisitions in the past. So it's an accretive asset that we think will be stronger uh, and more profitable in the hands of Boston and make us more uh, important for the vascular surgeon which is an area that uh, was a needs improvement for us, I would say, within that business unit. So now uh, we have the leverage, not the leverage, but the capabilities to present to, to vascular surgeons our broader PI portfolio, given the relationships that the Silk Road has team, Silk Road team has with the vascular surgeon. Brilliant. Thanks, Mike. The next question comes from Travis Steed with Bank of America. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks for taking the question. I, I wanted to ask, um, you know, given the strong margin guide raise and, you know, EPS guide raise here, where you're, where you're at kind of on the fair, fair pulse, uh, getting those to, to full margins in the scale there. Are you halfway there, kind of more or less, and if you're willing to sort of kind of continue to let that flow through? And I also wanted to ask about Taver. It felt like a little bit of a time change and, and tone change on, on Taver, so just wanted to make sure we didn't miss anything on the Taver update. Sure, I can start on the gross margin, and uh, and, and Mike can take the the Taver one. Uh, so, where are we on the journey? Uh, it's as Mike said, we're early in the journey in the United States relative to the uh, Faropulse launch. That co that corresponds pretty well with the gross margin story. So, if you think of uh, of where we are, the standard margin for Faropulse is absolutely accretive relative to the uh, uh, the catheter. So, uh, that's a that's a great uh, accretive. Uh, uh, gross margin growth driver. The things that in the initial stages are a little bit uh, dilutive are obviously you, you heard me talk about the inventory charges. 
uh, with respect to Polarex. So, you know, we don't want to take inventory charges, but when it's uh, when, when you're taking them as a result of the, the success of Ferropulse, you know, that's that's uh, it should be uh, temporary and should not be something that uh, that continues. So those should get better over time. Uh, the manufacturing variances. So we have. Uh, built our manufacturing capacity and our operations and supply chain team to be the leaders in this space. So we have uh, significant capacity. So uh, as we're uh, making the, the, the product today, it's a little underabsorbed relative to that. So that'll get better, obviously, as we make uh, make more, and, and that's obviously our plan. And then the capital placements are, are dilutive. Uh, again, it's not a huge uh, number relative to uh, to, to the overall gross margin for the company, but it does, you know, at the edges uh, kind of take that down a bit. So overall, I would say Ferropulse, uh, every quarter, Ferropulse will be a better contributor to margin. And I think as you get into 25 and 26, it'll be a significantly accretive uh, growth driver for gross margin for the company. Matt Tavi, uh, the European team has done really an outstanding quarter and outstanding quarters back to back with Accurate Neo 2, uh, over 20% growth. Uh, importantly, in, you know, we expect to launch in fourth quarter, maybe first quarter, 2025 Prime, <clears throat> which is our next generation uh, Accurate Neo 2 that has all risk indications and the full size matrix, which has been uh, the challenge for us to date with an optimized delivery in the valve frame. On the, just to reiterate, on the U.S. timing, uh, we did complete enrollment um, of the 1,500 patient cohort. And we do expect to present the data in the first half of 25, likely at the ACC meeting. I think it's important to note that this is the largest randomized trial that's been done in TAVI. And based on the, really based on the time of the last patient follow-up and the size of the trial and the multiple risks and mixed control groups that we have in it, uh, it's, it's, it's an extensive trial. And we believe that the first half 25 and likely at ACC is the appropriate timing. And then just as a quick follow-up to the uh... – uh, gross margin question, Travis. Uh, n- none of that's a surprise relative to gross margin. So uh, we've been saying all along that gross margin is not likely to help uh, the margin improvement story in 2024. But lo and behold, uh, we're able to increase the overall operating margin from 30 to 50 to 50 to 70. So I think uh, all's well on the uh, on the margin expansion front. Uh, really proud of that 50 to 70 relative to the guidance uh, for this year. And as you look to uh, 2025 and beyond, I think gross margin, I think all lines of the P&L can contribute to the, the margin expansion journey, and uh, gross margin will be one of those. Great. Very helpful. Thanks a lot. The next question comes from Josh Jennings with TD Cowan. Please go ahead. Good morning. Thanks a lot for taking the questions, and uh, congrats on the stellar results wanted to just follow up on Travis's two questions. I guess first on TAVR, uh, could we see top-line data before the ACC presentation next year, and, and could Boston file before that presentation? Um, and then just the, the other follow-up is just on, on the profitability. You guys are seeing letting, letting a lot of, of uh, profitability flow through on the outperformance on the top line. wanted to just uh, get a sense of of uh, taking some of that profitability and, and, and reinvesting that, you know, where, where could we see where, where some of those dollars going and, and just some high-level commentary on, on that uh, reinvestment driving, supporting this uh, sustainability of, of top-tier uh, revenue growth in, in the med-tech med space. Thanks for taking the questions. Yeah, Taver, uh, uh, Josh, maybe I'll take the Taver question first and then thing with Dan and Mike take the others. Uh, just really what Mike said, right? We, uh, last patient follow-up in the trial was uh, just in this quarter. It's a very large, very complex trial. And just uh, honestly, based on the timing of getting the data cleaned and getting the readouts from all of the various correlates that are engaged in, in getting us the analyses for the trial, we are going to miss the abstract deadlines for all of the major fall meetings. Those, those, those deadlines literally come up within a couple of weeks. Uh, and, and again, th- these data are so important and and pivotal, right? We we want to present this at a major meeting, and so right, the the first major cardiology meeting where we'll be able to meet an abstract deadline is going to be the ACC. Uh, would not expect you to see any data released ahead of that. 
And the second part of your question relative to the balance between reinvesting the sales upside uh, and uh, dropping some through, I, I think you're seeing the evidence of that here in our in our guidance raise for the 50 to 70. So I think we've struck a really good balance on that. So we've had sales upside during the year and uh, the realization that uh, we, we closed uh, the first half a little bit ahead of expectations. So we're giving some of that back. So we're taking the 30 to 50 to the 50 to 70. So that's great. At the same time, we are uh, reinvesting in the business, primarily in the commercial facing functions. We're leveraging the back office and, and the administrative areas, which makes sense. We don't need to grow those when you're growing the revenue at the rate that we're at. So we got significant leverage opportunities there. And then, as Mike said, it, this isn't just reinvesting in Ferripulse. This is reinvesting across the whole portfolio, the broad portfolio that we have. So we picked the right spots to, to reinvest to be able to continue to deliver that top line performance uh, for the long term. And I think we're striking a nice balance there. The next question comes from Danielle Antelfi with UBS. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for taking the question, and um, I'll be a broken record here. Congrats on the on the really awesome quarter. Um, Mike, I wanted to go um, in a different direction here, away from PFA for a second, and talk about how we should think just on this uh, theme of sustainability of growth into 2025, appreciating you won't give guidance here. But if we think about Asian DCB launching back half of this year and modular um, uh, in the back half, or I guess is that launching this year as well. So how do we think about those contributing, maybe elevating CRM growth above the market in next year, as well as the, the interventional cardiology portfolio? Thanks so much. Well, thank you for pointing that out, because I was getting hammered by text from our um, – agent team and our uh, CRM team from not mentioning those in that prior question. So I think if, if you're to continue to add on that discussion, which is how do we maintain and sustain high performance that's highly differentiated from the peer group uh, for the for many years to come. It's all the things we talked about before uh, with, with PFA and Watchman indication expansion. And you see, as you said with agent, um, kudos to that team. They're really transforming that portfolio you know, drug looting stents next year will probably be 2% of overall uh, Boston Scientific. And you're seeing tremendous growth in our imaging business with our IVIS imaging platform. And now we're the first one to have approval for agent, and that TPT uh, decision will be made soon, uh, soon, and uh, apply uh, in hopefully in January. And that is a, a market that we plan to, um, uh, to drive – where we have a multi-year advantage, where we have superiority data for what is at least 10% of the market with restenosis um, and appropriate price points. So that's going to accelerate the growth of that division and significantly improve the margin profile uh, over time. Uh, Why we continue to invest in clinical science and our structural heart portfolio. And also, uh, we have a very vast VC portfolio. And oftentimes, those VC investments come with dilution, which our team is able to manage uh, consistently while investing for the future, while improving margins at the same time. So I think that's a big part of it. As you do know, the CRM business is a bit of a lag for us. The international business did quite well. U.S. lagged a little bit. And the modular uh, ATP, the proud of the team for that. That was a long study, a very difficult project. Uh, but you saw the results of that, the SICD with the modular platform. And we're excited to launch that in 2025. So there are two other areas that I didn't mention before that you pointed out. And also, you know, what's not being mentioned here today is just the tremendous growth in our endo and euro businesses. You know, our euro business is near, near double digits for the first half. Our endo business is near double digit for the first half. Those are all accretive margin uh, companies for us. We're ex- very excited about the Axonix acquisition, which will have, a, you know, operational benefit in 2025 and organic in 2026 primarily. Uh, but it just makes those divisions even stronger. So, um there's many things to be excited about for the future of the company to continue on with a goal of differentiated performance. Thank you. The next question comes from Matthew O'Brien with Piper Scientific. Please go ahead. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much, Piper Sandler. Um, just maybe on, on just sticking with kind of where Danielle was going <laughs> outside of, um, outside of, uh, um, PFA, but just on the on the Watchman business, you know, 20% growth is a little bit of a tick up versus Q1. Um, 
you know, your competitor says they grew 45% in the quarter. So are you losing a little bit of share to those guys, or is the market starting to accelerate for some reason? I don't know if it's in front of this concomitant uh, reimbursement. Um, just, you know, maybe talk a little bit about that, and then maybe maybe for Dr. Stein specifically, if you get this, this concomitant reimbursement, can you just talk about the workflow for the clinician in terms of doing, doing a PFA case plus a watchman case at the same time? I mean, how much, how much more challenging is that? Do you have to bring in an IC sometimes and, and other times not bring an IC in? Do the watchman part of the case. Just maybe talk a little bit about that opportunity going forward. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just touch on the growth. You know, 20% is excellent. Um, we're in the midst of launching our Watchman Flex Pro, <clears throat> and maybe as importantly, uh, this new steerable sheath, which is early in its launch. And so I think the clinical data and the extremely high market share of Watchman speaks for itself, <clears throat> and the ongoing uh, R&D platforms that we're driving for Watchman and clinical science. So we are extremely comfortable that we're, you know, we're nearly 90% a share um, in the U.S., and you know, there may be some extremely price sensitive accounts that we'll occasionally lose business to, but it's a very, very small margin, very, very small, um, you know, numbers. And if you look at the size of this Watchman business and our share and our uh, technology lead, we're very comfortable uh, with the position we're in. Yeah, and in, in terms of just workflow and concomitant, this is one of the areas where I think in between, right, the safety and efficiency advantages of Watchman Flex and Flex Pro combined with the efficiency and safety advantages of Farapulse create a real advantage for us as a, a, a unified ecosystem. Uh, you know, the, the beauty of doing these two procedures together, right, is they both involve transeptal access into the left atrium. They both involve the catheter manipulation inside the left atrium. So there's a huge benefit to patients to be able to have it all done at one sitting as opposed to having to have one procedure and then go through many of the same risks of the first procedure, go and have it, have it done as a second procedure. Uh, and just to reiterate, when you think of doing it as a concomitant procedure, what you want are technologies that enable you to do it safely enable you to do it reproducibly, and enable you to do it efficiently so you're spending as little time as possible, right, mucking about inside someone's left atrium. And, and Farapulse and Watchman Flex Pro together are, are unmatched in giving you those advantages. And I understand there's time for one last question. Yes, please. Okay, that uh, last question will come from Matt Taylor with Jeffries. Please go ahead. Hi, <clears throat> good morning, guys. Thank you for taking the question. Congrats on the great quarter. Um, I did want to ask a follow-up question on, on Farapol, just to help the, with thinking about the modeling and the opportunity there. Could could you give us any kind of update or parameters on on how many centers you're in, how many boxes you've placed, and maybe talk about whether the early experience has changed your views on how the market could evolve uh, like you laid out at the, the analyst day several months ago. Yeah, I think the only piece of that we'll provide color on is the last part of it. We, we don't want to break out catheter usage, capital usage, how many sites. Um, I w would say the utilization rates of sites once they, once they use Ferripulse is very quick and sustainable. So we're not seeing hospitals turn it on and turn it off and go in and out of it um, like you see in many med tech uh, products. So the, the sustainability and usage of Ferripulse is very high once customers start using it. And obviously we have a chance to uh, sell more consoles to larger centers uh, in the existing accounts besides opening new, new accounts. And the second part was what? Um, at a senior moment. <laughs> this is, uh, uh, we've got, you got, you got some good conversion. Yeah, you got it. I got it. Okay, I got it. Great, thanks, Matt. Well, I, I ended it with a dud. Sorry, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. All right. Well, well, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, as always, we appreciate your interest in Boston Scientific. If we were unable to get to your question or have any follow-ups, please don't hesitate to reach out to the investor relations team. And before you disconnect, Drew will give you all the pertinent details for the replay. Thanks so much.
Thank you. Please note a recording will be available in one hour by dialing either 1-877-344-7529 or 1-412-317-0088 using replay code 2312308 until July 31st, 2024 at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time. The conference has now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect.